Welcome back to the equine anatomy lectures. Um, today we'll be talking about the um, equine forelimbs. Um, just before I start, I would like to um, remind you of the email address um, here that if you have any questions or uh, concerns, uh, please don't hesitate to, to email me and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to answer any, any of your questions. Now uh, back to the to the equine forelimb or the anatomy of the equine forelimb, the 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 limbs of the horse are the most important topic for a simple reason, and that's why, uh, and that's because they 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 do encounter uh, the majority of the problems in in equine, uh, because because they are exposed, they hit the ground, uh, they um, um the 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 forelimbs basically um. Are more frequently affected compared to the hind limbs, and 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 that's for a simple reason, and that is, uh, it it first hits the ground, uh, then um, it carries more weight compared to the hind limbs because of the um, extra weight of the of the head and the neck and the and the thorax, and and there as you uh, know, there is no articulation between the four limbs and the and the thorax, so so that's why the the four limbs are basically more more involved in in, um, in injuries and things like that. Okay, so so um, as I as I always uh, do in, in in my lectures, I uh, will will uh, first talk about why this topic is very important. We all already talked about that for a second, and that is because the the limbs are, are more exposed um, and also um, the forelimb carries more weight than the hind limb and also um, the forelimb um, hits the ground uh, uh, you know with the stride uh, before the, the hind limb does and and so and so first of all we'll talk about the significance um, more um, clinical cases, if you will, and then we'll talk about um, the joints and the muscles and the nerves of the um, of the forelimb. We will talk about a, a specific apparatus we call that the passive stay apparatus, a a mechanism uh, by which the body or the limb utilizes to um, to carry um, the heavy weight without um, a, a tension or 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 or. Uh, uh, stress on the on the tendons and on the um, on the uh, on the bones. Uh, so we'll talk about this mechanism or the passive stay apparatus, and then and then the third point we will uh, we will talk about lameness examination. How are we going to evaluate a lame horse, and how are we going to do nerve blocks and also um, joint um, injections. So these are the three main points that we will be uh, covering um, during this uh, during this lecture. We'll, we'll start with the significance first. Why why this topic is important? Why should I study the anatomy of the forelimb of the horse? Well, one of the most common uh, clinical cases in equine is, is called hoof abscesses. Uh, again, the the hoof is 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 touching the ground. Um, sometimes you have a an injury that opens the uh, the uh, uh, the the hoof and uh, creates an infection of some sort, uh, starts to be pretty painful, sometimes abscess uh, forms in there. We call that hoof abscess. We'll talk about that later, but, and, and you'll study it more in medicine and surgery. But the key fact here is that this is a pretty common case in equine practice, both medicine and surgery, and, and therefore we have to be aware of what are the structures of the hoof and how can we uh, basically uh, uh, clean it and take care of it and also and, and reduce or eliminate the amount of pain uh, produced by 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 this case by this um, uh, infection. So so studying the anatomy of the hoof is extremely extremely important. Another case that we will encounter uh, in horses, if you will, especially in race horses, is a case called called bowed tendon. The the tendon shape becomes like a bow and and this is a tendonitis it's a basic tendonitis uh, uh, case and uh, it's a, a this is the the tendon of the uh, superficial digital flexor uh, muscle and uh, this is pretty common and pretty pretty painful uh, 
and it affects the horse's ability to to um, to walk or to uh, to uh, to perform basically. And so and so understanding the anatomy of this of this area, the metacarpal area, if you will, is extremely important to understand the structures and the uh, what can affect them. Basic such as you know cases such as tendonitis, such as such as this case. So so we've presented two cases so far. Presented sole abscess or hoof abscess, which is very very common in equine practice, and also a bow tendon case, which is also pretty common in especially in race horses. So so that's why it's important to study the anatomy of the um, of the equine forelimb. A third case that that uh, you know we we call in equine medicine and surgery the nightmare of, of an equine clinician and that's a case of laminitis laminitis is a case where you have basically separation between the hoof and uh, p3 or the third phalanx uh, of the of the of the digit so so it, for example on on a the, this radiograph shows a parallel relationship between the uh, dorsal surface of the of p3 or the third phalanx and the hoof wall this is the thickness of the hoof wall right here and this is the parallel relationship between the hoof wall and between the dorsal aspect of p3 in cases of laminitis when we have separation due to a certain disease certain clinical cases again we'll talk about that later we will find that this relation this parallel relationship is lost so instead of the dorsal aspect of p3 becomes here it rotates caudally, as you can see here in this direction, and causes severe, severe pain. And sometimes we recommend even a, um, you know, putting the horse down because of, of these cases. It's pretty hard clinical case, especially at this stage when you have you have this severe separation between between P3 and the hoof wall. So, so that's also another another good reason. Um, uh, to 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 understand the anatomy of the um, of the um, of the equine limb, and 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 here I would like to mention that also um, studying the anatomy of the of the equine forelimb is especially from the from the metacarpus or metatarsus down, or that, it's the same. So as you will see in the hind limb, when we study the hind limb, we will only focus on the on the regions between the hip and the uh, uh, hock joints. Uh, we will not talk about the uh, carpus or, or the tarsus, uh, the metatarsal areas and um, the, the digit because it's the same in the forelimb and in the hind limb. So what I will cover here for the metacarpus and the digit, it's the same for the metatarsus and the digit. So we're not going to repeat them. It's the same clinical cases, the same structures, and everything is the same. I, I thought I'll mention this, um, uh, you know. So, so okay, so, so hoof abscesses is, is, is one of the clinical cases, very common. Uh, both tendons or tendonitis is another clinical case. This case of laminitis is very common and, and, and uh, extremely important for the health of the horse. Uh, that, all of these cases basically demonstrate that Studying the anatomy of the of the forelimb of the horse or the limbs in general is extremely important. So the anatomy of the of the limbs is is an is an extremely important topic. Another disease is uh, may or may not heard of. It's called navicular disease. This is this is the navicular bone, which is the distal uh, sesamoid uh, bone. Uh, this is P two. And this is P3, or the third phalanx right here. So you can see these circles, which we will talk about that later. We call those, those vascular channels. And, and, and all of these, these are degenerative changes due to, to a, 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 um, the aging process and also due to um, inflammation of the cartilages and of the bones here. Uh, osteoarthritis of, of the bone, which leads to osteoarthritic changes that we will call vascular channels later on. Um, here, I will explain it later, of course. But this we call that the navicular disease, very, very important disease in horses. And uh, also, uh, 
demonstrate how how important studying the equine anatomy of the of the four limbs is um, uh, in addition to the to the other diseases that I mentioned this is the carpal joints and we can we can uh, uh, this is the radius uh, this is the uh, proximal intercarpal bones this is the distal intercarpal bones or carpal bones and this is the metacarpus we'll talk about that in details later so the radius proximal row of carpal bones distal row of carpal bones and metacarpal bones you can see where the arrow here is pointing at it's pointing at what we call a chip fracture or OCD OCD and osteochondrosis desiccum lesion basically per part of the part of the bone due to, to continuous irritation continuous friction uh, here leads to a, um, a, a separation of small pieces that can be seen on radiographs floating in the in the joint area uh, here and that is and that is a very important disease also that, that uh, should uh, be removed uh, arthroscopically also so so this is this is also the lesion that you can you can see here floating in the in the joint space so that's that's also another important disease uh, that that um you know confirms that we have to study the anatomy of the limbs in order for us to be able to treat um, those those clinical cases very important clinical cases so so okay so having established this uh, uh, note now uh, i think it's appropriate to kind of study okay so what's the first what's the general structure of the of the joint just just as a uh, reminder i know you guys had it in in uh, in small animal anatomy uh, but but this is just a, a reminder what what's the joint because we're going to talk about that later when we talk about joints of the of the forelimb so let's talk about what are the the general structures of the joint this is this is a pretty basic uh, 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 joint basically two bones a proximal bone and a distal bone they are separated by a cartilage articular cartilage articular cartilage and here you have a joint capsule the inner surface of the joint capsule is basically a membrane that is able to generate or to secrete what we call synovial fluid the 10w30 the lubricant that basically keeps the the joints from uh, uh, from uh, being bone on bone uh, so the w1030 is or the 10w30 is the is the lubricant that keeps the joint moist and keeps the bone uh, the, the two bones from from friction between between each other so uh, and, and of course on the tendon you have a number of ligaments and tendons that are that are you know uh, inserted here to to strengthen the joint and also the bone is is also covered with the periosteum which basically uh, the the layer here that uh, will will protect the bone and also will generate uh, bones in in cases of fractures and things like that from osteoclasts um, uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts so the blasts are the generators of the of the of the of the bone whereas the clasts are the ones that eat up the dead bone basically so this is this is what the peritoneum here is having so so again the basic the basic structure is pretty simple two bones separated by articular cartilage to keep less friction friction between between the two bones and also uh, surrounded by a joint capsule that keeps secreting synovial fluid which is a lubricating uh, fluid again to reduce the friction uh, between between the two bones and you have a joint capsule that protects the joint on that you have a, a number of tendons of for, for muscles and ligaments that that uh, basically strengthen the the joints to keep it together and on each of the bones on the surface of the bones you have the periosteum which is basically the 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 cover for for the bones that has 
a, a number of, of, of cells, most importantly the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts, which are uh, the ones that uh, generate a new bone uh, or eat the dead bone re bones respectively. So osteoblast, osteoclast, generating bones, eating up dead bones respectively. Okay, so 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 now we we just reminded ourselves of okay, what are the the, the structures of a joint, um, and you will see how this is important when I talk later about each of these structures. For example, I'll talk about a procedure called periosteal stripping, uh, taking part of the periosteum uh, to to uh, to um, uh, promote uh, bone growth and things like that. So so that is or or delayed bone bone growth. That is that is a very important. Uh, thing to to um, uh, remember. So uh, the, the the most important thing we'll we'll talk about that in a second is the fact that each of these structures are important to stabilize the joint, the tendons, the ligaments, uh, the the periosteum. Uh, you know, in, in promoting bone growth and things like that. So we'll talk about that in a second. Now, now to, to start with, we have first to study or learn what are the joints of the forelimb first. What are the joints of the forelimb? So in the forelimb, you have six distinct joints. The first joint is the shoulder joint is an articulation between the distal end of the scapula and the proximal end of the humerus the second joint is the elbow joint and that is an articulation between the distal end of the humerus and the proximal ends of the radius and ulna radius and ulna the third joint of the forelimb consists of three joints. All of them are called the carpal joints. Carpal joints. We have three joints here. Radiocarpal between the distal end of the radius and the first row of carpal bones. We'll talk about that later. The second one is the intercarpal joint, which is an articulation between the first row and the second row of carpal bones. And then the third joint in the carpal joints is the carpal metacarpal joint. And that's an articulation between the second or the distal row of carpal bones and metacarpal bones. The proximal end of metacarpal bones, two, three, and four, medial to lateral, respectively. Two, three, and four, medial to lateral, respectively. So these are the three joints that we just mentioned in the in the forelimb: shoulder joint, elbow joint, and carpal joints. Now the next shows the other three joints in the forelimb, which are basically the digits here. We have a larger picture to show these three joints. So these are three, and the next slide will show the next three, which makes a total of six joints in the forelimb. These are the joints that I was talking about. And we have the fetlock joint as the fourth joint in the forelimb. And it's an articulation between the distal end of metacarpal bone 3 and the proximal end of the first phalanx. First phalanx. The fifth joint is the pastern joint. And the pastern joint is an articulation between the distal end of P1 or the first phalanx and the proximal end of the second phalanx. So that's the pastern joint. The third joint 
is an articulation between the distal end of the second phalanx, the proximal end of the third phalanx, or the coffin bone, we call it, the third phalanx is also known as the coffin uh, bone, as well as the uh, distal sesamoid bone. The distal sesamoid bone, also known as the navicular bone. Also known as the navicular bone. In the fetlock joint, by the way, I failed to mention that the articulation is not only between the distal end of the metacarpal bone 3 and the proximal end of the uh, first phalanx, which is this joint here, number 9 in this picture, but also with the proximal sesamoid bones, two sesamoid bones here. We will see them later uh, in, 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 in more clear pictures. So the fetlock joint is an articulation between the distal end of metacarpal bone 3, the proximal end of the first phalanx, and the two proximal sesamoid bones. This will make six joints in the forelimb. Shoulder, elbow, carpal, fetlock, pastern, and coffin. Later on, we will talk about each of these joints separately and the clinical relevance of that particular joint. Now, let's go and look at the muscles that cover these joints and these bones of the of the forelimb and the horse. So you can see uh, two views here, a lateral view of the forelimb and a medial view of the forelimb. A lateral view that starts with the scapula, the humerus, radius and ulna, carpus, metacarpus, and then fetlock, pastern, and coffin. The six joints that we talked about. Now, on the lateral aspect, of the forelimb, this picture, we will start with the scapula and the muscles on the lateral aspect of the scapula are supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. Supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. You will see these pictures many, many times after this because we will talk about each of the regions separately. And we will talk about some of the nerves that will supply them. We then come to the biceps brachialis. The biceps brachialis. Then we have the triceps muscle. These are both heads, the lateral head and the long head. The triceps muscle. So, so far we talked about the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, biceps, and triceps. So far, that's what we've talked about. Now, we talk about the muscles on the radius and ulna. Radius and ulna. 
first the extensor carpi radialis number 13 the extensor carpi obliquus is number 26 number 14 is the common digital extensor number 17 is the lateral digital extensor number 19 is the ulnaris lateralis muscle and here number 18 is the ulnar head of the deep digital flexor now when we go to the medial side again you will see these pictures many many times after this and we will explain each one of them this is just to mention the muscles in general in general now on the medial aspect of the scapula we have the sub scapularis muscle so in the lateral aspect we have the supraspinatus and infraspinatus on the medial aspect we have the sub scapularis sub mean, means under under the scapula and that's why it's under the scapula because it's the medial aspect of the scapula now we have also see the long head of the triceps and also the biceps brachialis and we see here a tendinous structure that's number 14 which is this one we'll talk about that later it's called the laceratus fibrosus laceratus fibrosus that's a very important structure when we will talk it's 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 called also the internal tendon of the biceps the internal tendon of the biceps and this tendinous strong tendinous structure we will utilize later when we talk about the passive stay apparatus the passive stay apparatus that apparatus which basically holds the limb standing and holding all the weight of of the animal without additional stress on the joints of the animals that upper, that this mechanism which is basically a a a collection of tendons and bones together they are set so the joints will have minimum tension on them that's why the horse keeps standing for a long period of time we will talk about that extensively later on but this is again this is a general overview of of, of this now after after the after talking about the laceratus fibrosis we will talk about the flexor carpi radialis this muscle right here number 17 flexor so remember there we have extensor on the lateral aspects extensor carpi radialis except common digital extensor uh, uh, and extensor carpi obliquus etc and 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 the lateral digital extensor uh, all of all of this N now on the medial aspect we have more flexors than extensors we have the flexor carpi radialis we have the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris number 20 we have number 19 the flexor carpi ulnaris the ulnar head and so on and so forth now of course we have the deep and the superficial digital flexors in in in, in inside or or deeper to these muscles now 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 here i would like to 
mentioned to you to please focus on the medial aspect of the radius especially and realize that there is no muscles on the medial aspect there are no muscles on the medial aspect of the of the radius let's take a look again at a at a different picture and we'll we'll we'll, we'll see how how that's important for us this is a dissection of the of the horse's forelimb from the medial aspect and you're looking here at number nine is the radius and here we don't see any muscles there is no muscles these are the deep and the superficial digital flexor tendons here this is cut of course but these are the accessory tendons for the deep and superficial digital uh, flexors but the, the the more important is that there's no muscles on the medial aspects of the aspect of the radius now how is this clinically important it is pretty important when we talk about a very important disease especially in newborn foals and that's called annular limb deformities angular limb deformities next time we will talk about the angular limb deformities and how can we treat them using the medial aspect of the radius until next time